Today, uh, we are going to learn the approach that CyberArk follows in order to manage the expectations we have from every privileged access security solution. And we are going to learn about the brief architecture of uh, a typical CyberArk environment. Okay. CyberArk has different modules, uh, different uh, components to perform different functionalities and all of these components are independent from each other and they need to install they need to be installed separately on separate servers right so the first component that you install in a cyber arc architecture is the cyber arc vault the first component that you install in a cyber arc architecture is cyber arc vault make it larger. CyberArk Vault. Okay. CyberArk Vault is uh, basically a repository for uh, all the privileged accounts that you are going to secure, policies, configurations, logs, and session recordings. Basically, anything that you can store inside a CyberArk architecture will be stored inside the CyberArk vault. This vault is basically a repository for all the information that you can store, privilege accounts, your policies, your configurations, logs, and recordings. Everything will be stored. stored and this particular uh, component. Okay. So let's say you want to implement all those, uh, you want to restrict the access to a particular privilege account. Okay. You want to impose a lot of restrictions and you do not want the passwords of the privilege accounts to be exposed. So you onboarded it into a CyberArk architecture. You onboarded a account. You onboarded an account inside the CyberArk vault. Let's say the username of this account is uh, privilege account one. And uh, the password of this account is XYZ. XYZ. Yeah. Username is privilege account one. Password is XYZ. Now, the privilege account information is uh, uh, secured inside CyberArk, and you want your users to still be able to retrieve the information, right? If let's say there are end users inside the infrastructure, end users in your organization that need this account, that need this account in order to log into the target systems, in order to connect to the target systems, they need the username and password of this account. And they are genuine user, they have certain authorization, they have all the approvals in place. So we will simply provision their access on the CyberArk system in order for them to be able to retrieve the privilege account information, right? We will simply allow them to log into the vault in order for them to be able to retrieve this information and they will simply use this account to connect to the different target system, right? But if you do that, if you just directly get them uh, access to the CyberArk vault, they might have access to a lot of sensitive information which vault has stored. A lot of sensitive information, your policies, your configuration, logs and recording. A lot of sensitive information can be exposed in this process by allowing the end users to have direct access to the vault. The other sensitive information can be exposed. So you need to ensure that without exposing all these sensitive information, you need to make this privilege account available for the end user. So for this purpose, we build another component of CyberArk, which is a, basically a front end user interface. We do not provide the accesses directly on the CyberArk vault. Instead, 
we provision the access on the front end UI. We are going to build another component here, which is going to act as a front end user interface. This component is called Password Vault Web Access. Okay. Password Vault Web Access is basically a front end user interface for the vault. Right, front end user interface for the vault. It's a web portal, basically a website URL will be there and you can use this website URL to access this password vault web access. Okay. Web portal. This web portal uh, is hosted on a web server. We'll talk about what web, what web server is and how do we build that later on in these coming sessions. Uh, but this is for uh, you to just get a brief idea of the architecture. Password Vault Web Access is going to retrieve all the information from the backend database. Look at it. Uh, uh, look at it uh, in such a way that this uh, Vault is your backend database, and this PBWA, this Password Vault Web Access, is a front-end user interface. This front-end user interface retrieves all the information from this backend database. Retrieves all the information from this backend database and populate it on the website. So your uh, use privilege account one is going to be visible here in this UI password as well. Along with this privilege account, uh, a lot of other information, every other information that you store on the world is going to be visible as well. So all the policies, configurations, logs, recordings, every other information is going to be visible on the password vault web access. And now if you want the users to retrieve any privilege accounts password from CyberArk, from CyberArk systems, you do not allow them to log into the vault server. You do not allow them to have direct access to the backend database. Instead, you allow them to have access to the front end user interface so that can, they can simply initiate a login to this front end interface and retrieve the required information from here. Okay, they can simply retrieve the required information from here, this privilege account username and the password. But in this case, uh, again, the same problem comes here. Uh, if the user, if the PVWA is retrieving all the information from the vault, and all the information is available here and we are allowing our end users to have the access to the information wouldn't the end user will be able to access policies and configuration and logs and recording that's not going to happen because pwa is going to have the capabilities pwa has the ability to filter out the information based on user type and their authorization. Based on the user type and their authorization. PVWA is going to filter out the information for you. Right? Now, this does not mean that if the end user is able to log into the PVWA, it gets access to all the information. Only the information that he is authorized to access only the information that he or she is authorized to access will be visible on this UI. Okay. One more thing to understand here, PVWA password vault web access is not a system that stores all these information. It only retrieves the information from backend database to populate it on the website. Okay. It's going to retrieve the information to populate just to be able to show it on the website. And as long as the connection between the password vault web access and the vault is there, the information will be populated. As soon as the connection gets uh, impacted, the PVWA is not going to be able to retrieve the information or show the information on the website. Just how any website work, uh, there is a backend database that is running on the backend, uh, which is allowing the website to show all the information. 
Similarly, password vault web access is going to retrieve the information in order to populate that on the web portal on the website. Okay. And now this password vault web access also has the capability to filter out the information based on the user type and their authorization. So only those information will be visible to the users, which they have access to. Okay. If the privilege account one, the user have access to privilege account one, only privilege account one will be visible, not any other privilege account. And this is what I mean by authorization. When, when I say user type, there are basically three types of user inside CyberArk. Three types of user in CyberArk. If you are able to log into this uh, web portal, if you have access to the system, you are either one of these three types of user. Either you can be an end user, end user will uh, have uh, access to privilege accounts. Only those privilege accounts that they have authorizations to access, those privilege accounts will be visible. Okay? But that's not true for uh, administrators. When any administrator, when any CyberArk administrator logs in to this PBWA page, apart from the privilege accounts, they are going to able would be able to see all the privilege accounts. But apart from the privilege accounts, they'll also be able to see the configurations. They'll also be able to see the uh, system health dashboard. System health dashboard, which will going to give them much more idea about what's happening on the CyberArk architecture. Apart from this, configuration, system health, uh, policies is going to be there. Right. So at the same time, if you allow any auditors to have the access, you allow any auditor to have uh, the access to the PBWA system, the auditors are going to be able to retrieve the privilege accounts, policies, They will also be able to see the recordings. They will also be able to see the logs. So based on the different types of users that are logging into this uh, PVWA systems, different types of information will be visible. Okay, Because the PVWA is going to retrieve all the information from the vault, the privilege accounts, policies, configuration, all the information. But for different types of user, different types of information will be visible. And for the end users, only those privilege accounts will end user as in any individual that wants to access the privilege account on border in CyberArk in order to connect to the systems that are end users for us. Okay? As a CyberArk administrators that are end, they are end users for us. So any end user uh, that has access to a particular privilege account, only that particular privilege account will be visible on the user interface. Rest of the privilege account will not be will not be shown up to the showing up to the end user. And uh, if administrator logs in, all these accesses will be available. If an, any auditor logs in, uh, the policies and logs and recordings will be visible. When you talk about end users, <clears throat> you'll have a hierarchy in an organization, right? Let's right? say so you have a bunch of BBAs and then you have a DBA manager, mm -hmm. system admins, and then, you know, a manager. So the manager, should have access to be able to look at session recordings as well for mm -hmm. their set of users, right? Mm -hmm. And report to them. If uh, that access is required, we can be more granular with permissions, Kapil. Uh, if let's say the accesses are approved, uh, we can uh, assign and limit the access to the particular set of accounts. We can allow manager to have uh, access to the logs and recordings for the set of accounts that mm -hmm. that comes under his governance. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. So that that is an important uh, point that typically you want that to happen right? because you need managers to first of all mm -hmm. see, see what that privilege their, uh, their okay. employees have so that they can enforce least privilege, right? Because rules keep changing, mm -hmm. and, and then uh, periodically audit you know, high target or high value systems, what they are doing, right? Absolutely. Now, the other thing is what kind of database is there what? Some proprietary mm -hmm. database or um, mm -hmm. a 
Can you throw some light on that? Sure. The vault uses a, a modified version of uh, MySQL database, but that is something that is managed by the software internally. You do not have a control on the database uh, directly as an administrator. You do not get to interact with the database tables. This is something that is managed by the vault internally. As an administrator, you only get access to the UI where you do the modifications and policies and configuration files. All those uh, changes will be updated to the backend database. So typically a database team does not manage this uh, vault. No, right? not really. No, not really. This is managed by the software internally. There is no separate team involved. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be managed, updated, all the information, all the values that you uh, change on side cyber arc systems. All the values are going to be updated on the backend database internally, right. automatically. No, 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 I understand that. I'm saying typically the, you know, in an organization, when you mm -hmm. go and fire up a database, mm -hmm. it typically is managed by the DBA team, right? Right, true. So in this case, because they, they don't have access, they will mm -hmm. not have access to the tables because right. it's a locked kind of system. Right. It doesn't matter. So the only thing that a system admin needs to do is install it. And then maybe if there's space needed, and the mm -hmm. space is what they provide. Um, and then whatever other requirements, right? Uh, you know, if it's a 16 core, eight core, four core, whatever, right? Memory and all that, right? right. So, mm -hmm. so there's no DBA. Okay, okay. So it's a, just a proprietary packaged uh, MySQL. Okay, cool. Sure. Sure. Okay. The next component we have inside the CyberArk architecture is called Central Policy Manager. So um, basically, who sets the, um, what's it called, like the, mm -hmm. uh, for example, like who can be an end user, who can be administrator, like, uh, do we do that? Or does the organization, like, do they set like, okay, you know, you have this many, um, mm -hmm. like, you, you can view these this many things and stuff, like they set themselves up. So uh, basically, on the technical side, administrators will be responsible to do that. But the process will be very simplified, you'll have groups created. Uh, for each of these user type. And let's say the organization decides that uh, these accounts should be onboarded to CyberArk and these users should have access to these accounts. Uh, mm -hmm. The users that want to access the accounts through CyberArk, they become the end user. They become the end user for CyberArk and they get added to the end user group. That's it, they have the access, they retrieve the account. That's the process for them. Mm -hmm. For administrator, if someone wants to become an administrator, it is, uh, again, has to go through all the approval channels and once the access is approved, they get added to the administrator group and adding to the group is something that is uh, uh, cyber administrator is responsible to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So this, there is an active directory integration here with AD? Uh, yes, if uh, you want to do that, most likely, uh, mostly 70 to 80 percent of the time, you'll see Active Directory into infrastructure integrated with uh, Cyber. Right. What's the licensing model for Cyber? Is it that once we purchase the Cyber Act license, we can, uh, I mean, we can have as many users uh, provided access to Cyber, or it is user based uh, license? There is a limitation there. There are user-based limitations. Um, there will be uh, some limitations mentioned on the license file. And okay. if you want to extend that, uh, you'll have to procure another, another licenses. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the licenses basically will be limited on a few aspects. You'll have to, uh, your first limitation will be the number of users. Second limitation will be the number of components that you are allowed to install, how many, password vault web access you can install in a particular architecture or how many session management component, how many password management component. Those are the limitations as well. Okay. okay. All right. Central policy manager. So uh, you should be able to define the complexity of the passwords or maybe even the password rotation. Uh, by password management, I mean that uh, this, uh, the CPM component should be able to rotate your passwords at frequent interval. Okay? This is not, uh, you should not keep static passwords for longer period. 
you should be able to change the password of your privilege accounts at, at a regular interval. And this is something that CPM does. You can define the policies related to the rotation frequency, okay? rotation period you can define, seeing that every 30 days or every 60 days, the password of your privilege account should change automatically every 30 days or uh, every 60 days, the password of your privilege account should change automatically. Right. Apart from this, uh, you should also be able to define the complexity of the password, as in uh, what would be the length of the password, does it include any special character, or does it include any digits, all of those information you should be able to uh, define, and the centered policy manager should be able to read those policies and execute the password changes based on whatever you have defined. Right. The central policy manager is going to lock into the vault every 30 days or every 60 days and it's going to do a password changes regularly it does not only do so on the cyber Act database it also it also has the ability to trigger the password changes on uh, different target systems as well let's say you have uh, windows systems or uh, linux systems it can log into those linux servers and windows server it can trigger the password change there as well okay it can even trigger the password change there as well, right? So uh, central policy manager can uh, perform the password changes and make sure that the passwords are in synchronization at all times so that if any end user retrieves the password from CyberArk, they get access to the correct password at all times. We'll talk about how the password management works on the target systems, what are the backend steps that gets executed during the password management process. We'll learn more about that when we talk about the central policy manager in a separate session. But this is something that uh, CPM is allowed to, uh, that CPM will be uh, responsible to do. The next component we have is called privilege session manager. Before you move to privilege session management, the central policy manager besides password rotation and mm -hmm. Complexity and strength and all of that. Is there any other policy here? Any other policy? Uh, basically, there are certain policies related to the uh, constant uh, verification whether the account's password is correct or not. Uh, there are policies related to change and uh, you can define how the password change happens. What is the rotation period? What is the uh, complexity? Uh, but apart from that, there is only one policy related to the password verification, which is uh, just to ensure whether the passwords are correctly updated on CyberDoc or not, or whether the password matches to what we have updated on the target system or not, in order to ensure that if end users are retrieving, they should be able to log into the target system with the password. Right. Okay. The CPM will have the policies only related to password. Uh, CPM does have another functionalities. Uh, it can, uh, it does have the ability to discover the accounts from your existing uh, systems, but we'll talk about that later. But policies okay. will only be defined related to the password management. Okay, got it. Policies will only be defined related to password management. All right. Yeah. Privilege session manager is basically a component that is responsible for session management. Responsible for session management. Uh, session management, as in what kind of session management it does, it is, there are three features that gets offered in the session management functionality. First one is session monitoring, session monitoring. Session monitoring, session monitoring as in the ability to track the activities of the end users, track the activities of the end users as in uh, if the users are using sensitive credentials to log into the target systems, they are using CyberArk to make those connections. 
what are the activities that they are performing inside the target systems once they are logged in. So let's say if a user use this uh, privilege account one to log into a system, what are the activities they did on inside the target system? Uh, let's say the user initiated a control panel window or a notepad window or any application on the server, the session monitoring feature of uh, privilege session manager is going to generate a text log tracking their activity, saying that uh, this user has logged into this uh, server using this account at this time. Once logged in, uh, the user has initiated control panel at this time, notepad at this time, application one at this time. Right, so it's going to keep a track of all the activities that you are performing inside the target systems when you are logged in with a sensitive credential. Along with that, the session recording feature we have here is going to record your entire session in video format. It's going to save all the recordings on the vault for auditors to see. Okay, so basically this ensures that you have accountability within the organization. You every every task that you are doing inside the target systems when you are logged in using a sensitive credential, all of that are being recorded, and auditors will have the control and visibility over your sessions, which practice is being initiated using sensitive credentials. Session monitoring and session recording, and uh, we have another feature called session isolation, which is basically just there to prevent the overlap of the information between two sessions if they are being initiated using the same account to connect to the same server right let me try to explain the isolation i know it might not be clear with uh, one single definition let me open another paint window try to explain it graphically let's say we have a server here isn't that we can have a lock that i the account can be used to open only one session at a time? That that can be done, uh, Vishish, that can be done. But what happens if the accounts are being used at different times by the same, by two different users? Let's consider a situation. Just keep me, just bear with me for uh, two minutes here. All right, thank you. Uh, let's say we have a Windows Server. Windows Server. Within the Windows Server, we have an account called uh, Administrator. We have an account called Administrator. Password will be XYZ. Right. Uh, we have an account called Administrator. Password will be XYZ. Uh, we have a... this account is basically a privileged account that is created on the server, and uh, we have a team of uh, five members. We have a team of, uh, let's say, five members, or maybe even three members. Okay. Let's call it, uh, call them uh, person one. We have uh, person two here. We have person three here. The organization did not want to create create uh, single accounts uh, for each individuals here, so they created one single account. Uh, the, they do not want to create uh, individual accounts for each of the members for them to be able to access this server. So they created one single account and they asked these team members to share this account. Okay, this is what we call a shared credential. This account will be shared by multiple members of the team in order to log into the server. They will be using this account to log into this particular server. At Let's say the P1 uh, use this account to connect to this server using a simple RDP connection. You just open the RDP connection, provided the IP address of the server, use the username and password to connect to this server. Once P1 connected on this server, P1 opened a text file here. P1 opened a text file here and wrote some uh, sensitive information, which uh, uh, he did not want to share with anyone else. It's uh, maybe his organizational password or maybe some sensitive details that he does not want anyone else to see. But as soon as the P1 logs off, okay, P2 uses the same account to connect to the same server. P2 uses the same account to connect to the same server. And since 
we uh, in the server it does not really identify the individual users here server all the server is going to see that this administrator account is logging in again it's going to resume the old session that p1 had that means all the files will be visible for p2 and that is something we want to avoid okay, we do not want the information to overlap between two different session even if they are being initiated using the same account to connect to the same server okay this is something that we want to prevent this should not happen and session isolation uh, feature of cyberac is going to do exactly that okay session isolation feature will ensure that even if the users are using the same account to connect to the same server the information is not overlapping uh, p1 uh, whatever files that they save is not visible for p2 that's what session isolation does so in this use case if p1 logs in again mm -hmm. they will be able to see their files or no they will be able to see that files that's the uh, idea here right one uh, basically it's going to uh, isolate one single session and dedicatedly create it for one single user even when they log off and let's say uh, they log in after two or three hours uh, later they will get the same session resume but for p2 a different session will be created so it's creating a logical mapping right. of sure. an end user to a session shared account. To the individual yes. okay i'm curious to see how that is being done because to your point windows mm -hmm. doesn't know for yeah. it it's just the same account that's right. logging in right it's going to create two separate uh, user profiles in order to do that Okay, so it's doing profiles and yes. okay. session monitoring, session recording, and session isolation. These are the features that uh, a privileged session manager can uh, uh, implement in order to ensure that there are accountability and there are detailed audit trails generated for every user when they are using the sensitive credentials within the organization. Okay. So this session isolation it does also for Unix systems. Yes, for Linux systems, for uh, uh, databases, for uh, even for the websites and portal, you will have uh, two different sessions of Chrome or Internet Explorer created with different uh, registry settings and different uh, uh, history, different uh, cached protocols. All of that, yeah. two different uh, sessions will be created. the monitoring recording and isolation feature extends to uh, most of the platforms that are available on cyberart okay? we'll talk about how many platforms are available and how we can get an extension of the platforms uh, that will come later in the sessions okay? all right so this is what uh, privileged session manager does so let's understand how it works end to end. Uh, how does the end user establish connections to the target systems and how does uh, the users use the accounts and what is the capabilities of auditors here? Let's say we have a server here. In this case, let's say we have a normal Windows server. We have a Windows server. Windows server has an account called uh, privileged account one, right? privileged account one, the password was XYZ. Earlier when there was no CyberArk implemented, users were simply initiating this uh, remote desktop connection, providing the IP address, username and password. The passwords were exposed to them and they were simply making the connections, which was very risky, uh, had a lot of risk associated. There was no audit logs generated, passwords were exposed. So when you implemented CyberArk, we, you uh, onboarded, this will be uh, directed from uh, security and compliance department of your organization that as soon as the CyberArk is implemented, the account has to be onboarded in CyberArk. The account has to be onboarded inside CyberArk. 
to impose a lot of restrictions on the end users. We do not want to allow them to access uh, the password directly. We do not want to expose the passwords to anyone. So you onboarded the account inside CyberArk. As soon as the account was onboarded here, CPM triggers a password change. Let's say the passwords were exposed. Uh, you're going to trigger a password change here. Let's say now the password is XYZ1. The end users do not know the password. The password is now no longer exposed to any end user. They cannot initiate the direct connection. This is restricted now. So if they have a genuine requirement to use the account to connect to the systems, they will have to log into the password vault web access first. Okay. Here, they'll have to authenticate with their credentials. And in some cases, we will even implement multi-factor authentication here. The default authentication will be that they'll have to uh, authenticate with their AD credentials. And uh, once the authentication is done, they would be able to log in. But in some cases, to provide another layer of security, you can even implement multi-factor authentication system. You can integrate CyberArk with uh, a lot of other multi-factor authentication solutions out there in the market. You can uh, do Duo, Radius, uh, Okta, RSC tokens, a lot of MFA solutions are out there. Once you integrate uh, any MFA solution here, uh, the users will have to go through two factors of authentication. And once they are authenticated properly, they will be able to see this account in the UI. And beside this account, they'll also see a connect button. There will be a connect button on the user interface. When they click on the connect button, they'll be asked for an IP address that they want to connect to. They'll be asked for an IP address where they want to initiate the connections. So let's say the user provided the IP address of this server. The user provided the IP address of this server. A connection will be initiated since this is a uh, web portal opened in uh, user's local machine itself. So a connection will be initiated uh, from user's local machine to this target system. The connection, however, will not go directly to the target system. It's going to go through a jump server, which is Privilege Session Manager. And since Privilege Session Manager is going to be uh, sitting between the user machine and the target system, it's going to be able to provide all the monitoring, recording, and isolation. It's going to be able to provide the monitoring, recording, and isolation. This is what Privilege Session Manager does. It provides another layer of security in your authentication process, sorry, in your connection process, right? And since it is acting as a jump server between the user's machine and the target system, it will be able to provide all these functionality to you. Once the connection is established, it's going to start the session recording and all the recordings will ultimately be transferred to the vault. From the vault, PBWA retrieves all the details. Auditors will be logging into the PBWA in order to retrieve the recordings. And this is how the typical cyber arc architecture is going to work. The, the user gives a target IP here, right? Right. Or um, once he gives a target IP mm -hmm. or a host name, right. so then what happens actually? Is it uh, obviously privilege session manager needs to get into the middle of that mm -hmm. transaction so that it right. can do the recording and, and certainly it needs to go and get the credentials from the vault. So that is okay. Right. But where is so, so the remote desktop um, mm -hmm. session, he's mm -hmm. actually firing off from his local? No, the, uh, basically uh, as soon as the user clicks on the connect button, a RDP file will be generated and that RDP file will have some predefined configurations. Predefined configuration as in the IP address of PSM server will be mentioned. Users right. will not have to provide any uh, address or username or pro uh, password. All they need to do is provide the IP address on the user interface. And a predefined RDP configuration file will be generated. As mm -hmm. soon as they click on the downloaded file, they will be uh, the connection will be established to the Privilege Session Manager automatically. And then on the Privilege Session Manager, the backend process starts. 
an RDP file will be generated. Uh, the IP address and uh, sorry, the IP address, username, and password will be fetched from the vault and connection to established. Okay. okay. I do not uh, want to go into much more technical details, but to give you a brief uh, overview, this is how it works. Okay. Uh, connection RDP file will be generated with some predefined configurations. Uh, the configuration. No, that, that, yeah, that's that makes sense. That makes sense. RDP five will get generated. It will then mm -hmm. basically start proxying the request over yeah. to the privilege session manager. But what I was wondering is that mm -hmm. on the user will he won't know what's happening, right? Meaning, no, absolutely. The, the and user all day. RDP client will be running from his particular desktop. Yes. Right. RDP oh. client will be uh, uh, run from his particular desktop. Connection mm -hmm. to the PSM server established, yeah, right, and right, from right. the PSM, another RDP session will be generated to the target correct. system. Correct, 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 correct. Okay, okay. Right. All right. So this is how. Uh, if you are, uh, for all uh, others, if you are not able to understand, this is uh, uh, this is the. I mean, the, there is no uh, expectation for you to understand all of this at this point of time. This is a very brief uh, architecture. We'll talk about all of the processes that we just discussed in more detail in coming sessions. We'll have a separate one for a privilege session manager, where we will get to understand all the backend processes that get executed during the session workflow. Each time the end user clicks on the connect button, what are the steps that are involved in order to establish the connection to the target systems? We'll talk all about that if you are not able to understand it clearly. This is just to give you a brief overview on how, how many components CyberArk has and what is the functionality of each of these components. 